Thank you for watching Friendship Community Church Sermons on Demand. We're pleased you have decided to view our pulpit messages. Our Sermons on Demand are a ministry of Friendship Community Church and are provided as a resource to anyone who desires to study the Word of God. So open your Bible and get ready to dig into the Word of God and see what God has for you today. is a little bit long this morning. I'm warning you up front. How many of you have uh, been reading ahead and know where we're going to be, what we're going to be talking about this morning? Just Dan, Pat, no one else? Okay. So we're, we, we just had a song about uh, building God's kingdom here. And we're going to cover the first uh, few verses of chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Anybody, anybody other than Dan and Pat know what that talks about? Very good. Do you know what that means? Head coverings. We... Uh, the paragraph that we're going to look at this morning is one that I suspect most Christians don't spend a lot of time on. This is uncomfortable to most men pastors. I would have said most pastors, but not all pastors are men. They should be, but they're not. Some people don't get scripture, right? Um, and we'll deal with that at a different point. But this is uncomfortable. Because it's going to sound like I'm a chauvinist this morning. And some of you will be ready to throw things at me. But just remember, I didn't write it. I report it. Okay? Remember the overall theme that we're in, in this uh, section of 1 Corinthians. It's Christian liberty. I bet you've never thought about head coverings for women in the, un, in the context of Christian liberty. In verse 2 of chapter 2, Paul begins to refine the theme a little bit more by writing about Christian liberty in relation to Christian worship. He'll develop this through chapter 14 and verse 40. So for the next several chapters, he's going to be working on, the, on refining his, his delivery of Christian liberty in the context of Christian worship. So let's dig in to see what uh, God has in the revealed text for us today. In our society today, the role of women has become a central battleground. I don't know if you've noticed in the last 50 or 60 years, we've had a battle for women's rights. We've had a battle to redefine the family. It used to be that the family was mom and dad and kids. Now the family is dad and dad and kids, or mom and mom and kids, or kids and no mom and dad, or however you want to define the family. It is becoming increasingly more um, obscure, a proper definition, or a, a real definition of family out in the world. I think much of this battle has been inspired by Satan himself because he knows that if he can destroy the family and the home, everything else is simple for him to destroy. The very foundation of our society is the marital unit of the home. And if Satan can destroy that, it's much simpler for him to, de to destroy the rest of society. So he spent a great deal of time and effort to disrupt the family and the home. The world wasn't too different in Corinth, the days that Paul was writing to the church in Corinth. We know he's received communications from them and responded to those questions. Remember back in chapter 7, verse 1, he said, hey, here's the answer to the questions you wrote me about. 
Well, I believe he's answering another one of those questions. He was pleased that they were considering what he was talking about. He was pleased that they were writing to him and asking for direction in their life. Look at chapter 11, verse 2. I praise you because you remembered me in everything and maintained the traditions just as I passed them on to you. He taught them in person for a year and a half. He also had communicated with them through other means. He spoke to them. He wrote to them by letter. He had sent, communi he sent people to communicate for him. He had spoke to them repeatedly about things. Here he praises them for being loyal to his teaching as he gave it to them. Here in, our, in the passage that we're looking at this morning in the, in the translation I'm using, it's the Net Bible. The, the word transition or uh, traditions there is the Greek word uh, paradosis, which means doctrine or teaching, give, teaching given from one to another. He said... I praise you because you remember in everything and maintain the doctrine that I taught you. That's special. He had been there and discussed with them and taught them something that was being remembered by them that they were maintaining. The real issue for the Corinthians was not their theology. The real issue for the Corinthians was not what they understood about God, it's how they lived. Their lives were a wreck. Their theology was good, but their lives didn't reflect the theology. It's like many in the church today that claim to believe the Bible and that they desire to live according to the Bible, but in many ways, they look just like the world around them. You know, the Christian doesn't decidedly different than the world by and large today. The average pew goer, pew sitter, church goer doesn't look different than the non pew sitter, church goer. And that was the issue that Paul was facing in Corinth. So let's take a look at the principle as he states it and then we'll develop it. Remember, I didn't write this, okay? But I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Just saying that in this country, in the atmosphere we're in, could cause us to lose our 501c3. Just understand that. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with, your, with us losing our tax benefit because of a claim like that, because God made the claim, not me. These are God's words. Paul makes sure to state the principle as clearly and succinctly as possible. He praises them for keeping the doctrine they knew, but then said, but I want you to know. Thank you for following what I, or for knowing what I taught you before, but I want you to know. That Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. Paul was concerned about this issue. Not just the issue of head coverings, but the entire issue of the family and its destruction. There's also a sense in the text here that Paul was addressing a doctrine that he had not presented to them before. He was teaching them something new. Thank you for listening to what I've said before. Thank you for knowing what I've said. But now I want you to know this as well. It's not unusual for women in Greek culture to only be in the background. Many women to be the object of prostitution was their only life. They were, in many ways, considered to be second-class citizens, if citizens at all. They were objects to be owned by men. Remember when we started 1 Corinthians, we talked about the four different kinds of marriage? It wasn't unusual for a man to divorce his wife, selling him to another man. Perfectly legal in the system. 
Women were not held to a high regard. That was true also in Roman culture. They rarely had authority on their own or the ability to function on their own. But within the church, they were given dignity and honor. For the first time, for most women in the church in Corinth, they were receiving dignity and honor because they were viewed by the church as co-equal heirs of the blessings of Jesus Christ. There's a sense in Paul's response to the Corinthians that honor for the women is something that these women had never received but had just been abused. The intent of the section is not to show the difference of value between men and women in the church, but there's a different level of function God designed for men and women. Here in our text, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. That word head is the word kephale, which refers to the ruling or sovereign part of the body. Who rules what your body does? The head. That's the sense of the word that's being used there. The word is used in both a literal sense, a physical sense, a literal physical sense, and a metaphorical sense. It is used to describe the head, but it's also used to describe the sovereign. And I think we can see that as we, we, we read the text. During our study this morning, we're going to see that, that Paul gives three examples or ways that headship is manifested. Jesus Christ is the head of every man. Man is the head of a woman. God is the head of Jesus. Jesus is uniquely the head of the church. He died for it. He bought it off the slave market of sin. He is uniquely the one qualified and called to be the head of the church. He sacrificed his position in heaven to become a dirty diapered baby so that he could grow into a man and suffer the cross and suffer the separation from the Father to pay your penalty of sin. Since he bought us, he owns us, and is our head. In real terms, you are slaves to Jesus Christ. Pick up John MacArthur's book, Slaves, and read that. The Western church has done you a disservice by telling you that slave is not the word used there. By saying it means servant. No, it means slave. There's a chain around your neck that belongs to Jesus Christ. That's the reality of your relationship. But he's a benevolent, loving slave owner. The next one makes a little less clear sense. You know, Jesus Christ is the head of every man. That makes perfect sense. The next one is a little bit fuzzier for us. Some have attempted to argue that Paul is saying that all women, all women must be in subjection to all men. Some are saying that man is the head of woman. So the highest ranking woman is still below the lowest ranking man. A lot of people try to argue that. They will have whole societies that look that way. There are churches that are built like that. Another thing is that just as the church is subject to Jesus, men, or I'm sorry, women are subject to men. How does that work? Then there are others that attempt to nullify this passage by saying, here's what Paul wrote in Galatians. He kind of says the, the opposite. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. See, there's no difference. So how can women be subject to man? Because Paul says there's, there's neither male nor female. So they completely nullify that. Now 
It's true that Chuck's favorite Greek word, gynikos, which is translated as woman, can also be translated as wife. He likes to run around calling Elaine Gooney. It's true that that word can be translated. You could, you could go back to, to our text here and that the man is the head of a woman and translate that as wife, just like we use in English. Woman sometimes refers to wife. Sometimes. That could be what Paul had in, in view in our text. The same is true for the Greek word an heir or man. It can also mean, dependent on context, husband. In that way, you could read that the husband is the head of the wife. You could read it that way. That would be a perfectly acceptable translation of the text based on context. But I'm not sure it's the proper hermeneutic of the text. I think it'll become a little clearer as we get a little further into the text. The final example is God is the head of Jesus Christ. When Jesus taught, he made it perfectly clear that he submitted himself to the will of the Father. That was made abundantly clear in the Gospels. But it's also true that Jesus has never been, whether it's before his incarnation, during his incarnation, or after his resurrection, during his time on earth or after, he's never been seen as inferior to the Father. In subjection, in willing subjection, but not inferior. Subjection does not infer inferior at all. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father to fulfill divine purposes. Why did Jesus get rid or set aside some of his divine attributes? He's the creative agent seen in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. He's the one that maintains it all according to Colossians 1. Why would he take that exalted position at the right hand of the Father and set those aside? and spend nine months in the fetal position inside of Mary's belly only to be born and to require someone to feed him and change his diaper and to teach him to walk and to teach him how not to smash his thumb with a hammer in the shop and all the other things he had to learn. Why would he go through that humiliation just to go to the cross? and go through the humiliation and separation of the cross. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father to, to fulfill divine purposes. But that doesn't infer that he's in. He just accepted the divine will of the Father and accomplished it. In verse 3, Paul ties these three examples together. Just as Jesus is subject to the Father... The church is subject to Jesus, and women are subject to men. To remove one part of that formula makes the whole formula collapse. Made it very clear the way he wrote it. Now, before some of you women pick up things to throw at me, take a look at what John, Dr. John MacArthur wrote in his... Uh, in his um, work on, on 1 Corinthians. It is clear that a man's being the head of a woman means the same thing as Christ being the head of man. That is, sovereign leadership requiring submission. That recognizes the benefit of such leadership of love. See, the world is telling us this can't be right because they don't factor in the responsibility of the man. Did God the Father love Jesus? Absolutely. Did he agonize over sending him to the cross? Absolutely. But he loved him. He does it out of love. 
The headship of the man in a, in a relationship with a woman is out of love. Husbands, love your wife like Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Husbands, you want to know how to lead your wife? Be willing to die for her. Anything less than that is not leadership. It is domineering. It is being a non-benevolent slave owner. How many Kunta Kinti slave owners do you know willing to die for their slave? Love your wife as Christ loves the church and was willing to die for her. Requiring submission that recognizes the benefit of such leadership of love. I love those words that Dr. MacArthur wrote. The authority and submission in each of these cases is based upon love and not tyranny. When the God the Father sent Jesus to become a man, it wasn't out of punishment or anger. He wasn't upset with Jesus. He loved him. And he wanted him to fulfill the role that he had called him to fulfill. Love of the world and love for his son. Jesus loves the church so much he died for the church. The church would not be in existence without the death of Jesus. His rule of the church is not that of a tyrant, but of a benevolent master. He loves his church and sacrificed his life for her. I suspect that none of us have any issues with those. I don't think we have any question that Jesus loves the church. Why then do we superimpose in the argument the question about the love of a man for a woman in proper leadership? It's only subjection of women to men that there's an issue. But when men follow the example of the other two examples given, they lead in love and not as tyrants. If men are going to be like God the Father and Jesus Christ, they're going to lead out of love, not out of tyranny. In many ways, this issue has been an issue since the Garden of Eden. Adam told Eve that God had said what God had said about the eating of the fruit. God had given Adam specific instructions. Of all the trees in the garden or the orchard you can eat, don't eat of this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. At some point, Adam relayed that to Eve. We don't have that recorded in Scripture. But Eve knew <coughs> excuse me, what God had said. Eve knew what God had said, so it had to be reported. He instructed her properly. But Eve rejected his direction and saw that the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was good for food. And she ate from it. She rejected his leadership. Men are not given the leadership over women because they're more valuable or have greater ability. Men are not made leaders because they're better. In many ways, we're worse. Amen. A lot of things we can't do near as well as women. May, dare I say, most things. But simply because the design of God in accordance with His will is why men have been given the position of leadership. We'll develop that more in a little bit. It's not a matter of relative dignity or of worth. It's a matter of job assignment. What job did God give to the man and what job did God give to the woman? It's not a matter of worth. It's not a matter of dignity. Within the church, women have more dignity than anywhere else in the world. Go to Islam... What kind of dignity do women have there? We'll see that in a bit. The principle applied. How is Paul going to apply this principle? Look at chapter 11, verse 4. Any man who prays and prophesies with his head covered disgraces his head. But any woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered disgraces her head, for it is one and the same thing as having a shaved head. For if a woman will not cover her head, she should cut off her hair. 
But if it's disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off her head, shaved, she should cover her head. We need to understand something here. Paul is, re is referring to activities of Christians involved in ministry activities before the public. Paul is saying, if you're going to pray or prophesy in public, especially where it's clear and proper testimony is essential. Who prays is the Greek word pros prosukomonos, generally ta talking to God and in the context of the church, it would mean talking to God about people, events, needs, and desires. Talking to God in public, saying, God, here's what we need. Here's what we believe. God, you are a great and awesome God. It's worshiping God verbally. It is praying to God. It is reaching out to God. It is talking to him directly. Prophesying is the Greek word prophetion which generally means to speak what's inspired by God. I've told you repeatedly that prophecy is not just foretelling the future. It's saying something that you have no way to know except it comes by God. In the strictest sense, it's the revelation of something that can only be known by inspiration of God. However, within the early church, by the time Paul was writing to the Corinthians, the word had been used in a less strict form to generally mean preaching the word of God. In that sense, what I'm doing is prophesying. I am preaching to you God's word. That is, in a less formal, strict sense, the way the word began to be used in the early church. It's interesting that that, word, that use of the word is only in the church. We only see that in Christian writing, the less stricter use of that word. So Paul is saying for a man to pray or preach with his head covered disgraces his head. For a man to pray or preach with his head covered is a disgrace. That's what Paul is saying. And for a woman who prays or preaches with her head uncovered disgraces her head. A woman's going to stand up in public in a service where testimony is, is, is essential. Praying or preaching with her head uncovered is a disgrace. It's difficult to get a firm handle on this passage because we don't have a lot of historical data to go from. Some state that the Greek custom was for men to not wear head, co head coverings in worship or in pagan temples. Others teach the exact opposite, that they did wear he head coverings in pagan worship. The Jews wore the talith, but in 2 Corinthians, Paul teaches that they, they did that because they misunderstood the direction of Moses, the talith or the veil. They misunderstood the direction of Moses when he put a veil on his face because he'd come down from the mountain being face to face with God. He had a bright sunburn and it affected them. And so he covered his face. And in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, they misunderstood that. And as a result, they ended up wearing a head covering themselves. So Paul was addressing here is difficult to determine. What was the custom that was going on in the age? But the instructions are clear. Men, no head covering while praying or preaching. Women, head covering while praying or preaching. The, those instructions are very clear. What prompted it is a little bit more unclear. With his head covered is literally, the, the, the text literally says, hanging down from his head. You know, we, we think of the, of the Jewish kippah, or in America they say yarmulke. We think of that. That's not at all the view here. We're talking about a long veil that flows down, much like the prayer shawl that you see many uh, Jews wearing. But over your head, or you might even consider it to be like a kafia, like the, the Arab headdress the, 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 that wraps around the head and falls over the shoulders. I should have brought mine today. 
So Paul is saying that a man while preaching or praying in public can't have his head covered with a veil. So the natural question you have to ask is, why? What difference does it make? To quote a former Secretary of State. The natural question is, why? Why would Paul say this? What's significant about the veil, in particular, or any kind of head covering in general? In the first century church and in the first century society, there were numerous symbols uh, which were used to signify a wife's subjection to the husband. The most common symbol was some form of head covering. That was the most common signal in the first century, uh, symbol used in the first century. The most common form of head covering was a veil type of garment, which was part of an outer garment worn by women. We still see that kind of attire for married women in the Middle East. And then you have the nutballs that used to run Afghanistan, that have taken things to the illogical extreme. And we have the burqa. That is the illogical end of the discussion. Because they didn't want to have anybody see anything of the married women. The intent, of, the intent of the veil was to tell everyone who sees the woman that, that she's not going to reveal herself to anybody but her husband. Of course, the Taliban kind of went too far with that. As with any principle, it can be taken way too far. For the early church, women engaged in ministry, a head covering such as a veil, was important to signify her devotion to her husband and her following, her commitment to following God. For the men to then stand up and have their head covering, it was a complete role reversal. If the woman was to wear the head covering to show their following of their husband and their commitment to God, for the man to stand up and have his head covered during those times, it would be a complete role reversal. A man would be taking the place of a woman by ministering with his head covering, specifically with a veil. However, in Corinth, at the time that Paul was writing, they were in the midst of a feminist revolution. Much like we've gone through here. Instead of burning their bras, they were burning their burqas. They were in a revolution because they had been oppressed. Their head coverings were coming off. And yet some women were still getting up in the church preaching and praying without their heads covered. Participating in the revolution and bringing the revolution into church. Just as a man prays and preaches with his head covered reverses the roles, when a woman prays or preaches with her head uncovered, the roles are reversed again. The woman gives no indication of her subjection to her husband or her commitment to God. Not a good situation. In Corinth, there was a revolt going on with women leaving their husbands and seeking independence. They were going to get rid of the taskmaster of their husband and be independent. They refused to care for their children. They shacked up with other men. They demanded to be hired for jobs that had traditionally been done by, by men and didn't include women. They changed their attire so they looked just like a man. They cut their hair short or shaved it entirely. Sound familiar? Sounds like uh, some of the movements we've had going on in our country in the last 50 or 60 years, right? These are all documented facts. Historians have well documented the feminism revolt of the first century in the Greek world. Documented as good as anything can be documented. We have lots of accounts in extra biblical accounts, in early church writing, and in non biblical, non Christian historians. 
I think based upon the context of this passage in the middle of the discussion of Christian liberty, the wearing of certain clothes like the head covering during ministry times was a matter of Christian liberty. Just like eating meat offered to idols. Got to remember the whole context here. Paul is talking about liberty. What do we do? What do we not do? So I think just as Paul said, we saw last week, as Paul discussed about eating meat offered to idols, it's not a big deal. But don't offend someone. And I think when Paul was talking about those non-ministry times for the women, that it wasn't a big issue. But he's made some specific statements here that we need to deal with. In the middle of the feminist movement in Corinth, that was reflected in the way women in church acted, Paul made some direct declarative statements for us to understand. As I studied this, I realized that dress is largely subject to local customs. And unless it's immodest or sexually suggestive, there is no moral or spiritual significance to what you wear. When we were in, uh, in the southeast of uh, the state a few weeks ago, and we were preaching in the Haitian churches, they were dressed to the nines. I mean, they spent more money on their clothes than all of us collectively did this morning. Okay? Just one person. They all had suits and ties, and the women had fancy dresses and hats, and they were always dressed to the nines. Are they more spiritual than us? Because we choose in our culture here in southwest Florida, more laid back, to wear polo shirts. Is that a spiritual thing? Or is it a cultural thing? It's a cultural thing. So I think that unless it is, is immodest or sexually suggestive, what you wear doesn't matter. And I think that extends to the veil or head covering as well. Would my message be more godly if I had a suit and tie on? Some preachers would say yes, but I don't think so. Oh, what was that? Might be shorter. Might be shorter? Not likely. The real issue is the subordination of women to men, not the symbol of that subordination that Paul's concerned with in the passage. He's not teaching about what to wear, but how to act. This is not a statement about, by Paul about what to wear. It's a statement about how to act in ministry. But the passage also introduces another confusion for us. Paul mentions a woman praying and prophesying. Some use this to say that Paul never const constricted a woman from preaching in a church. He's talking about if she prays or preaches in church, she has to have her head covered. Wait, I thought we couldn't have women preachers. It would seem that these verses are in conflict with what Paul would say in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 14, verse 34, The woman should be silent in the church, for they are not permitted to speak. Rather, let them be in submission, as in fact the law says. So which is it, Paul? Can they pray and preach, or do they have to be quiet? I'm really proud of you, Chuck. You didn't make a word. Didn't say a word. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. She must remain quiet. quiet. Paul is writing to young Pastor Timothy, setting up his congregation probably in Ephesus. When we put these verses together with our passage in 1 Corinthians 11 and other passages, it reveals to us that a woman is not able to hold a position of authority over a man in the church. She's not allowed to teach publicly in the church when men are present. We know that a woman in the early church had the gift of prophecy. Look what it says in Acts chapter 21, 9. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. So the use of the gift in the church 
it would have to be when men weren't present, meaning they could teach other women. We know that that's a gift for women, for the older women to teach the younger women. And I don't mean those younger women. Paul makes it clear in Titus and 1 Timothy. Listen to this quote from Dr. MacArthur. In other words, it's only necessary to combine the relevant passages to get the co composite truth. Women may preach and prophesy within the boundaries of God's revelation and with a proper sense of submission. And it is critical that their deportment in so doing reflects God's order. Certainly, they must not appear rebellious against God's will. The importance of the passage is not the head covering. It's that when men and women pray or preach, they do so in accordance with the proper distinction of the roles God has given. Every man should speak as a man and every woman should speak as a woman. These roles should never be reversed and never should be blurred. A woman cannot preach at any time. There are restrictions so that she does not usurp the role of the man. She can't just get up and preach at any time she wants. There are restrictions. Take a look again at chapter 11, verse 6. For if a woman will not cover her head, she should cut off her hair. But if she's... But if it is disgraceful for a woman to have her hair cut off or to her head shaved, she should cover her head. In Corinth at the time of Paul's writing, the only women who shaved their heads were prostitutes and extreme feminists. If you're going to preach or pray with your head uncovered, ladies, shave your head, is what Paul's saying. And go ahead and act like the prostitute you are. That's what Paul was saying. By usurping the role, you were saying, I'm the one in charge. You had reversed the roles. The extreme feminists showed their allegiance by shaving their heads. The Talmud indicates that the Jews considered a woman with a shaved head as extremely ugly. Chrysostom, the Archbishop of Constantinople in the, in the 300s, recorded that women guilty of adultery had their heads shaved and were marked as prostitutes. Shaving the head was an indication you have revolted the system. Shaving the head for a woman was an indication that you alone thought you were on top and that you were the boss. So then we conclude that Paul was saying, if you're not willing to look like a prostitute or a rebellious feminist by cutting off your head, don't pray or prophesy with your head uncovered. Don't pray or prophesy with your head uncovered unless you want to be seen as usurping the man's role in the church. Now he moves on to defend the principle. He doesn't want to just leave it set there. He wants to, to defend it now. For a man should not have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. For a man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was there a man created for the sake of woman, but woman for man. For this reason, a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. While head covering as a symbol is as much a custom as our wardrobe is, the principle of male headship is not a custom, but is a matter of God's order and cre of creation. And as such, it should never be compromised. Since head coverings is a symbol for the Corinthian world, a man should never have his head covered while he's preaching or prophesying or uh, praying. He is the image and glory of God. Man was uniquely created in the image of God. He was created by God to be. God created Adam and put him in the garden and made all the animals come before him. And he named them all. And he looked at them all. He said, yep, nope, doesn't fit, nope, 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 nope determined that there was not a helper for him in all the animals. 
Women were created in the image of God. That's true. Sure, they're created in the image of God. Paul's specific original creative act was the creation of man from the dust of the ground. Eve wasn't created out of the dust of the ground. God took that ball of dirt and made Adam. And from, dirt ball, yeah. And he was too, because he caused us sin. And from that dirt ball, Adam arises. And from the side of Adam, he creates Eve. That's the specific point that Paul's making here. Now jump all the way over in your Bible, all the way to the left. Gen Let's take a look quickly at Genesis chapter 3. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his descendants. Scripture does not say, uh, what the heck happened here? It's supposed to be Genesis, not Galatians. Let me read it to you. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your labor pains, uh, your labor pains. With pain you will give birth to children. You will want to control your husband, but he will dominate you. But to Adam he said, because you observed your wife and ate from or I'm sorry, you obeyed your wife and ate from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground thanks to you. In painful toil you will eat of it the days of your life. Of course, this is part of the curse. This is part of the judgment God had on Adam and Eve for their sin. The curse was not that man ruled over one. The curse was not that Adam was now to rule over Eve. The curse was for Eve that she wanted to rule, but Adam was the one called to rule. How many lives doesn't that happen in? Because in many ways, the woman is better than the man, is able to make better decisions, is able to do things better. And so there we have this built-in conflict in every marriage. The man is responsible to rule, and the woman knows how to do it better. It's just built in. It is part of the curse that we have because of sin. Some have interpreted it to mean that your desire shall be to have your husband's place and authority. Eve demonstrated that in her rejection of Adam's instruction to her, which ultimately came from God, she rejected his authority. Adam said, don't eat from this tree. I wouldn't be surprised if he didn't even put a little fence around it. Eve, don't go over the fence. Okay? Don't eat this fruit. Well, these, all these trees look really good. That one looks really good. You know, of course, Satan's helping her out, right? Is that what God really said? Well, I don't need to listen to my husband. Yeah, it's good for food. And she ate it and gave to her husband. Now he's the dirt bag that plunged us into sin because he then abdicated his role. What should he have done? I told you don't go over the fence. You're in, you're, you're in timeout. You're punished. Or I think he had the power. He could have just killed her. If he had performed his role with authority properly, it would be completely different. She decided with some encouragement from Satan that she could determine for herself what was good for food all on her own. After the fall, the rule of man over a woman was enhanced and strengthened. But the woman still had the, des the desire to do it. On the other hand, then, the woman is the glory of man, Paul wrote. Eve wasn't created to be helped by man. God didn't create Eve so Adam could help her. He created Eve so she could help him accomplish the mission God had given them collectively. Be fruitful and multiply only makes sense to them. It doesn't make sense to Eve and it doesn't make sense to Adam. It makes sense to them. Adam needed Eve to have babies. And so she was there to help him in the mission God had given. The woman was made manifest 
to man's authority and will. Just as man was made to manifest the authority and will of God. God gave direction to Adam. Adam gave direction to Eve. That's the way creation occurred. Don't misunderstand. Within the church, a woman is equal in the sanctifying grace of God to every man. You are just as saved as the men, ladies. A woman is equally the image of God that man is. That image is equally, equally restored through faith in Jesus Christ. But a woman is not directly the glory of God as man is. She's the glory of man, who is the glory of God. Her role is to submit to the direction of man to whom the divine dominion is given. Paul goes another step by saying that man did not come originally from woman. Now, I recognize that every man here today was born of a woman. But the first one wasn't. Eve came from Adam. Adam didn't come from Eve. She was named woman because she was taken from the side of man. Made from his flesh and bones. Made from his substance. That in itself defends the principle that we're talking about here. Not only was Eve created from flesh and blood from Adam, she was created for Adam. The picture that, that I just talked about where Adam is, before Eve has been created, he's looking at all the animals and naming them. And nope, don't see one, God. Not one suitable. Not one that I want to ask out on a date, sorry. So God caused Adam to sleep deeply and cut out of him some flesh and blood from his side. And out of that tissue, God formed Eve. When Adam woke up, he said, oh yeah, that's my girl. He recognized her immediately as the one God had called for him. She's the one that's just right. Anatomically, they fit together. Socially, they fit together. They are made perfectly for each other. Couldn't be said for any of the other animals. For any animals. But when he woke up and he saw Eve, he knew right then and there that was his girl. Eve was made specifically for Adam. God did not make Eve intellectually inferior to Adam or even morally inferior to Adam. She was in every way equal to Adam, except in position. Her position was different than Adam's, but just as equal. Adam was the head, and Eve was to submit. Can you ever have leaders without followers? Doesn't make one more superior, other than in position, than the other. Now jump back to... To 1 Corinthians chapter 11, let's look at verse 10. For this reason, a woman should have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Because women came from man, because she's subject to man, because she is the glory of man, she should have on her head a symbol of authority. Paul's use of the word exuen which we have translated as symbol of authority, does not specifically mean a head covering. It does not specifically say a head covering. It's really the idea of having received authority to do something. It's like when you go someplace to a sporting event or whatever. I saw in Caitlin's car Saturday, she had on the dash a parking pass for Jermaine, or for, uh, Jermaine Arena. That's the word. She had been given authority to take her car in the parking lot and to park it there. That's what Paul is saying. The symbol of authority on her head. She'd been given the symbol of authority. And we have an interesting and often confusing phrase at the end of verse 10. Because of the angels. What do the angels have to do with it? 
I think it's clear that Paul is referring to angels and not just messengers. I think he's talking about the created beings that are yet in heaven and maybe even the fallen ones. Angels. Angels have a great power, but that power is a derived power. It's a submissive power. Angels don't have the right or the power to do anything they want. They do what God directs them to do. Power comes from God and is not inherent in their own beings. Satan and the demons th sought to use that power for their own goals. And it resulted in the fall. So why then would Paul include them in such a statement at the end of talking about the submission, submission of women or the symbol of submissiveness of women to men. I think the reason is seen in the role angels play in the church. They are the protector and guard of the church. They are the most submissive beings in the world, and with a job to guard and protect the church, they easily could be offended by a woman not observing proper decorum and roles assigned. Job tells us these angels saw the rest of creation and know the roles God had designed. I believe that the angels were created first on day one of creation. And that they were witnesses to the rest of the creative act of God. The book of Job tells us that they there saw creation as it happened. When we add to that our understanding to our understanding of what Jesus says in Matthew 18, we get uh, somewhere. What is going on with my stuff here, guys? Let me read it to you. Matthew 18:10. See that you do not disdain one of these little ones, for I tell you that their angels in heaven always see the faith, face of my Father in heaven. Angels are guards of the church. They saw creation. They know the prescribed roles of a man and a woman. Can you imagine the look on the face of angels as they stare into the glorious face of our Father when a woman usurps the role in the church of a man? The look of a ghast on their face and the feeling of pain on his face. I think that's what Paul's talking about here. Why should women remember their rightful roles? Is so that the Father's not offended and the angels aren't offended. I think that's what Paul's saying here. Let's take a look at the principle of harmonized. Verses 11 and 12. In any case, in the, in the Lord, women... In any case, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man. Nor is man independent of woman. For just as a woman came from a man, so, come, so man comes through the woman. But all things come from God. Satan has many tools in his toolbox and arrows in his quiver. If he can't get us to reject the Bible outright, maybe he can get us to misinterpret it or misimply, misapply it. Paul reminds his readers of their mutual dependence on one another and their equality. I depend on my wife all the time. She's the sane one in the house. She knows when I'm gone astray in my thoughts and in how I'm supposed to respond. She's the one that's sensitive to your needs. In many ways, I could care less. My focus is on studying the Word of God. And she says, did you remember to say such and such to so-and-so? Because I could spend my entire day deep in the Word and forget I have a responsibility to the minister as well. Paul reminds his readers of their mutual dependence on one another. It is delegated by God to man. It's a derived authority. Delegated by God to man. I don't possess my authority in my own, on my own. It's given to me by God. God gave it to Adam and it's come to man since. God gave man the authority over women for God's purposes, not for man's. It's not my purpose to put you in burqas. 
That's man usurping the authority. My authority is to, is to teach you and to grow you and to develop you. Man has not right to use authority given by God to abuse women or oppress women. Can't say you can't drive a car like they do in Saudi Arabia to women. God didn't give me this authority to oppress women or to lord over them. Far from oppressing women, in fact, the church has been the greatest liberator of women. The Greek and Roman society where women were little more than slaves. We saw early in our study of 1 Corinthians that there were four kinds of marriages. We talked about this earlier. And women were actually sold to each other in divorce. Or to other men in divorce. It was for those reasons that the feminist movement in Corinth was going strong. But the church elevated women to the point of equality in the Lord. Within the church, they work as a team. It was a pleasure this past Tuesday in Sebring to examine Jose Marquez for ordination, for a recommendation on ordination. We had a privilege that we don't often get in ordination exams. We had the privilege to, exam to, to interview his wife as well, his partner in the ministry. Jose said that they do everything together in ministry. They do all their visits together. They do all their counseling together. They do everything together in ministry. They're a team working together to serve God. Very often in churches are kept alive by women with little or no support from men. Women are essential to the church. Men and women are dependent on each other in the service of God. The first woman was made from the man, but every man since has come from a woman. I'm dependent on, on the ladies of this church to do all of the ministering that goes on here. Because most of us men don't think that way. And God knows that. And he's put together good teams. Now, very quickly, the principle responded to. Judge for yourselves, Paul says. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory, for her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone intends to quarrel about this, we have no other practice, no, nor do the churches of God. Paul kind of sets aside his apostolic authority here. I think Paul, as he was writing this, or as he was dictating this to his secretary, he took off his apostle's hat, and he said, now I'm just Paul. You decide for yourselves. I'm not going to give you an edict. I'm not going to tell you women put on head coverings. Paul says, you decide for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray with her head uncovered? He then goes on to remind them that nature itself gives the example. Anyone who can see me, those of you that are here, those that are watching, can tell a great illustration of what Paul is saying here. Men's hair reaches the third stage of hair development much faster than women's. Three stages of hair development. Growth, dormancy, and falling out. It happens to us all. But Norm and I, Tom, we're in this together. Chuck, if you turn them around. We lose our hair much faster. Doesn't nature teach us? Bill? Thanks. Jared? Dan? Scotty, what the heck is going on with you? He's in a hurry. Testosterone causes hair to fall out. Estrogen causes hair not to fall out. What can I say, brother? Some women in Corinth weren't happy with the plan of God and the roles God had given them. 
He anticipated that there would be some that want to argue about this. And he says, look, don't, I'm not going to argue about it. So he declares to them, he gives them an, apostle, an apostolic edict. He first says, you decide. And then he puts his hat back on because his head was getting cold because he was bald too. He puts his hat back on and he said, look, we have no other practice, neither do the churches of God. He has made his point and declared the intention of God. God ordained the roles. Women are submissive to men. That's the role that God has ordained. Just like Linda asked me yesterday, should she be wearing a head covering? And I'm sure some of you are thinking the same thing. Is that what I'm saying? And in our history, even in our history of this church, that has been something that has been done. We went through a period of church history where head coverings were worn by women. Even in this church, we had a period of, of our history where several women wore head covering during church. I'm not saying here that women have to wear head coverings to show their submission to men. I think in many ways it's a cultural statement. I think in many ways the head covering is a cultural thing. But I will insist on is that the ordained roles for men and women be observed. That's why we don't have any women elders. Although you probably could do the job better. God said no. That the women of this congregation serve in submission to their husbands in serving God. That women not teach in the church men. Not that they don't teach. Some of you ladies are really good teachers. You can prob Some of you are probably even better preachers than me. Which, I mean, I, admittedly, that's a low bar. But God has said no when men are present. Teaching women, teaching kids, that's acceptable. Matter of fact, that's encouraged by the Apostle Paul. Knowing that submission to a man does not mean slavery to men. Knowing that the man has to rule in love, not in tyranny. Submission is not submission to a tyrant. It's submission to someone who loves. So just as Paul said, ladies, for yourselves, judge if you need to display your subjection to men through the use of, of attire or action or your actions are enough. Do you need to put something on your head so everybody knows because your actions aren't enough? That's something you'll have to decide. And I think that's what Paul was saying. I don't think Paul was saying that every woman has to wear a head covering in church. I think, I think he was saying every woman has to be in submission and has to display that. But if you can't, put on a hat so that we can know that we need to teach you more. Do your actions display your theology? See, that's the whole issue Paul was having here. In Corinth, their actions didn't display their theology. They had learned the lesson, but they didn't live the lesson. And I think the lesson here is, live what you learn. Submission in the church, just as the church is submissive to Christ, as Christ is submissive to the, to the Father. Not that we want to be tyrants, because God will judge that as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for such a passage as this, even though it is often confusing and difficult to understand. We know that you are a, a God that ultimately makes it clear, and we trust that we have done that this morning that we have made your word clear. We, we love you and we want to serve you in everything that we do, and I think I can speak for the women as well, that they want to serve you in their proper role. Lord, I respect the women of this church. You know that. I think all the elders do. We love our wives. We love what they do for us, their partnership in ministry. We love all the women of this church and respect them and know that 
that our heart is not one to put a burqa on them. Our heart is one to encourage them in ministry in the proper role that God has ordained. We love you and we look forward to great things from you in the days, weeks, and months to come. Thank you for all that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for watching this Sermon on Demand at Friendship Community Church. If this message has been helpful to you in your understanding of the Word of God, please let folks at Friendship Community Church know by sending an email to watching at friendshipcomchurch.org. Thank you again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Community Church. Thank you.